Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, let me introduce myself. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Hoyer. Can you all hear me? Shana, can you hear me? Are you? Okay. Um, I'm a professor um, of 19th and 20th century art at the University of North Florida. I've been there, I think I'm coming up on 20 years. Um, I'm not sure where those 20 years went, but uh, it's been a while. Uh, and so, um, uh, I am I am really excited to be here tonight. I was thinking about that today, um, partially because uh, this is my first return to a museum setting since COVID broke out. Uh, and I, I'm, you know, as we come up on Thanksgiving, thinking in terms of, wow, I'm, I'm grateful to be back in a cultural institution. I'm, I'm grateful to be back in a shared space with other human beings uh, to talk to you without the mediation of Zoom. Um, and so uh, I, I, I thank you all for being here tonight uh, and kind of sharing this with me in this space as we return to sort of thinking about how to come back uh, and look at art and gather um, as hopefully the pandemic sort of moves away after two, two long years, I guess, is where we're at on this. Um, so. We have come together tonight um, as part of a series of lectures that uh, the museum has organized, Ideas of Our Time. Uh, this is an ongoing lecture series uh, that the museum features in examination of uh, topics and issues that are of significance importance to our investigation and our understanding um, of contemporary art. And I will be speaking, title of my talk is Portrayed, uh, Self-Representation in Contemporary Art. And I am an art historian by trade, uh, so I'm going to anchor us briefly in the history of um, self-representation and portraiture, and then bring us through a discussion um, about how self-portraiture would be used in the modern era, and then into the postmodern era, into the contemporary era. So, um, as we are talking about the issue of self-representation, sort of the broader theme that I'm interested in here is the issue of identity. Uh, and when I think of contemporary art and contemporary society, that feels to me like one of the most important issues that we talk about and think about today. This issue of identity, when you think of identity, it's who you regard yourself to be, who you are, and how you then express that to somebody else. And identity is such a slippery concept uh, in terms of, well, is it your private identity or your public identity? And is it your public identity or your social identity? So this issue of identity is, is sort of a very complex and complicated issue. Uh, but I think it's an important one to sort of unpack and think about as we look at examples of uh, contemporary art. Because these issues have been intertwined together um, across art history. Um, Things to think about as you think about this issue of identity. You think about gender, sexuality. It's not just your physical self. If you were to pull out an identification, all the information that would be on there. But it, we go beyond just the likeness of what you look like. Um, but the various aspects such as your your profession, your social class, your um, perhaps ethnic, cultural background, your political views, your religious beliefs, all of these concepts are intertwined together. Uh, and how much of that is, is presented by you and how much of that does somebody else understand about you uh, and uh, comprehend about you as you present that information to the world. For artists, this issue of um, identity is um, constantly threaded 
through art and art history. Uh, in particular, we see it manifested in representations of portrait. Uh, portraiture in particular across time has been the way that artists have um, explored, examined, and addressed this issue of um, identity. And so we're, we're using the exhibition, the left side, right side, as a bit of a leaping off point or a starting point to thinking about what it means, woo, ah, here we go what it means to um, represent oneself. So when I think about portraiture, I frequently teach portraiture in the classroom to my students. I teach uh, classes on 18th century and 19th century portraiture. And I uh, distinctly uh, recall an instance. I was um, living in London. I was teaching for Florida State. And we were walking through the National Portrait Gallery. And I was beginning to speak about the second room of portraits, which was, I think, the Stuart room um, of portraits. And my students audibly groaned at the thought of looking at portraits. And I was really taken aback by it. And uh, I kind of share this, this story with my students today when I think about um, looking at portraits and talking about portraits. And I ask the students, well, why, why this reaction? I mean, how many of you, when you go into a museum and you look at portraits, really kind of sit there and enjoy it? Or is there something that there's almost like a wall that keeps you perhaps from really understanding what you're looking at? The student explained it to me when I inquired why this reaction, and they said, well, it's a bit like looking at somebody else's yearbook. I don't know who these people are, and I'm not sure why I should care. And I was struck by that because one of the things that I immediately thought of was, well, wait a minute, you're assuming that portraiture is, is nothing more than the mimetic representation of a subject's visual identity or visual appearance. And there's so much more to comprehend about portraiture. Um, it's a much more complicated um, concept and a much more complicated um, art form. And it's an art form that grows more complicated, I think, across time, particularly as you get into the postmodern time period when the very concepts of what self-portraiture and portraiture involve begin to be challenged and interrogated um, and destabilized to the point where we are now, which I think we're at a really sort of um, um, fascinating and perhaps frightening moment in contemporary art in this issue of portraiture and self-portraiture. Um, and so we'll, we'll come back around to that issue as we sort of wind up um, uh, the talk. Um, as I mentioned, this exhibition is um, the left side, right side, which was curated by the Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, and it is an exhibition that is comprised of 20th and 21st century um, portraits. Um, the works have been drawn from the permanent collection of the Museum of Contemporary Art, and they have also been drawn from the Jacobson Collection of American Art, um, a collection that I've worked um, quite a bit with um, over the past couple years uh, in terms of um, working to help sort of research some of the pieces in that collection. And in that collection, there's a little niche collection um, of self-portraits. Now. Assembled together in the left side, right side uh, exhibition, we have um, categories or classifications of portraits. On one hand, we have portraits by artists. Then we have portraits of artists. And then we have artists' self-portraits. So those groupings coming together question this issue or, or sort of explore this issue of um, how representation um, plays out through these different sort of groups. 
Now, we're not, me, I'm not going to sit here and, and sort of go through the entire history of portraiture and sort of explore every different one of those elements. I'm specifically interested in this issue of self-portraiture. Um, I find it to be a really sort of fascinating um, little genre, subcategory that you find within uh, the portrait tradition. A couple portraits of um, some of the artists. Now, as I noted, I am an art historian, and my, my tradition is always to sort of anchor everything firmly in an art historical past. After all, if we're going to challenge the concepts of uh, self-portraiture, we really sort of have to have a sense of where portraiture has come from in order to understand where it is going and how it is being challenged. And so while you can find examples of portraits going back to the Middle Ages, a smattering of them, some of the best examples, of course, are in the Renaissance. The revival of the classical past as we get into the 16th century. Of course, the Renaissance is the time period of humanism. The celebration of individual genius, the celebration of the individual's accomplishment. Perhaps one of the most prolific artists creating portraits of himself at this time period is Albert Dürer. German artist, perhaps best known as an engraver, he created over 20 portraits in his lifetime. I brought in two examples, one to sort of play off of the other, but this is his self-portrait, age 26, 1471. And I show this to you really as sort of an early example of how an artist was using portraiture to define himself and to establish his identity. And that's sort of a key idea here with the, how they are establishing the tradition of self-portraiture. The role of the artist is in a position of authority. He is defining himself. After all, if you think about this, who is his audience? himself. These are portraits for himself. They're not commissioned. They're not going on the wall of a cathedral. They're not going into somebody's living room. He is painting these of himself. And it's a way of him to sort of reaffirm his accomplishments as an artist. Here he is as a young man. He's achieved some uh, renown as an artist. And he is really sort of focusing on, of course, presenting himself as a gentleman not as a craftsman, not as a worker, but as an artist, a scholar, and a gentleman. And his clothing is to reflect that. His hands covered in gloves, indicating that, again, he doesn't work with his hands. And of course, his really sort of fancy clothes that he's wearing. Contrast this image to a work that he would create nearly 25 years later. Probably one of the most striking self-portraits in all of art history. His 1500 portrait. It's striking in a number of different ways. If you were to see this portrait in person, the amount of detail is extraordinary. Here the artist is showing his ability of meticulous focus, capturing every hair, every tendril. When you look at this in person, you can see the pores on his hands, the individual hairs on the fur lining of his, um, his coat, his eyelashes. Everything is captured. He is demonstrating to himself, his viewers, his skill as an artist, what he has achieved, his ability to master the likeness. He is representing himself as he sees himself. It is, of course, based on a reflection of himself. Artists using the mirror and focusing then on their reflection, painting himself as he sees it. What's more interesting than perhaps his skill at how he is portraying him or representing his physicalness is the idea that he is presenting of himself. completely frontal. That frontal position as he looks directly out at you, his hands placed just above the edge of the painting, calling attention to the, the skill of his hands, 
He has selected that pose very, very carefully. It's very rare in portraiture at this time period. However, it's not rare in art at this time period. It's, of course, based on representations of Christ. In the Byzantine tradition, the, Pi the Christ Pentacra portrait of the frontal representation of Christ, the authority of him, is a well-established and well-known tradition carried on into the late 15th century. Here you have an example um, by Hans Memling. Christ making the sign of the blessing with his hands. Durr is deliberately mimicking that. Because what is he saying about himself? He's not just celebrating himself for his skill, but he's saying something about himself as an artist, that he is a creator a creator of images. Christ is a creator, and he is equating himself on a level with that, that element of genius that he is demonstrating to his viewer and demonstrating to himself. Another artist that we can look at and sort of anchor ourselves in, a uh, well-known artist for this time period is, of course, Rembrandt. Probably no other artist back from the 17th century has produced more portraits of himself than Rembrandt. Studying his image throughout art's history, we see him in images of the young man. We see him clear through to old age constantly coming back and studying himself, this sort of fascination with trying to understand who he is. It's very different than what Durr was doing. Durr was demonstrating his ability to represent the exterior. Rembrandt is delving into something more psychological. He's not fixated on the minutia of observed detail of what you see with Durer's work. Instead, it's more loosely painted, suggestive fluffs of hair, tufts of a mustache, using a palette knife to build up the surface of the flesh so that you have this distinct surface. But all of his focus, then, is on the face, and in particular on the eyes. What Rembrandt is doing here is creating an image that is much more intimate for you. He's stressing his humanity. You have a sense of vulnerability. You have a sense that he is trying to give you a sense of who he is beyond the surface exterior delving deeper. It's a bit of a cliche, but that idea of the eyes or the windows of the soul, that sort of probing psychological image. Now, as I mentioned, the, uh, and as you know, hopefully if you haven't seen the left side, right side um, exhibition that you will, the exhibition features a small room to the side which features historical portraits. And when we say historical, we're really talking modern portraits. Works of art from the 20th century up to the time period of around the 1960s, 1950s, um, cut off around the 1950s. The earliest work to be included in that small gallery is the Thomas Anschutz Study for a Self Portrait from 1910. It's a haunting work. I've always found it a bit intimidating when I look at it because the glare that he gives as he's looking out at the audience or at his viewer. And in this instance, this is a portrait that he created literally for an audience. He didn't create this for himself. This was actually a work that he created as part of what is referred to as a diploma portrait for his induction into the National Academy of Design. Now, most artists would be inducted perhaps a little earlier in their career. Anschutz would be inducted literally in the last years of his life, after a nearly 49-year career as one of the leading painters in America. He finally gets inducted uh, into the National Academy of Design. And the National Academy has a tradition of once you are inducted or invited to join, that you then produce a portrait of yourself to represent your skill, but then also it becomes this idea of you're a member of the club. So your portrait is 
for your club members. It's to show you as an equal. It is to show you as a member. In this image, again, it's a study. It's not a finished work. He is turning out of this sort of half light and looking at the, the viewer or the audience. He doesn't wear a fancy costume. Instead, he wears a painter's smock that's over his dress shirt. And you can just make out a little bit of sort of the pink and white stripes here of his shirt. But the smock identifies that sort of uniform of the practicing artist. We don't have the palette and brushes here. We don't have the easel placed in front of him. He's pausing and he's turning out and catching his reflection. His gaze is interrogating as he looks out. And you wouldn't have to know anything about Anschutz with this portrait in order to understand that this was an artist who specialized in realism and careful observation and scrutiny of his subject matter. He captures a sense of that in the actual pose. Can you imagine being his model or his subject and having him glare out as he watches you, as he's painting you? He's applying that same intensity in his own self-portrait. Now, ultimately, the work is not submitted and completed as his induction piece. He decides instead to go with an earlier work a work that he would actually create several years beforehand and kind of already had on hand, a finished portrait. A finished portrait that shows him with the tools of the trade, that shows him to be more of a member of the club. And I've put this alongside a photograph of him because you can't talk about portraiture and self-portraiture without acknowledging the advent of photography and how this will impact portraiture. With the advent of photography, it's no longer the portraitist's responsibility to produce the most accurate likeness of the individual because guess what? The camera will always do it better than you can. So instead, as you move into the 20th century with modernism, the artists begin to move away from this idea of using portraiture as producing the most accurate likeness of them, like we saw with Durer. And instead, using portraiture as really a means to explore their allegiance to various modernist styles that they are experimenting with. It creates this bit of division in terms of they're not telling you who they are beyond the fact that, oh, I work with color and expressionism, or I'm a gestural painter. They restrict you from really having any deeper understanding of who they are as a human being. And instead, they simply are telling you, I'm an artist and I paint in this type of style. Joseph Solomon, not a terribly well-known painter in American art history, but certainly an example then of um, uh, American artists that are exploring then the use of color and expressionism. In this portrait, you can see he has painted his face sort of in these tones of blue and purple. His intention is not to be accurate in any sense. His intention is not to capture um, a, a portrait, um, a photo realist likeness of himself, but rather to capture a sense of his mood at that moment and employing his style to do so. I brought in a couple other examples of his work to sort of show you. He works with portraits throughout his career in terms of constantly coming back to himself something that artists frequently do because you're the most convenient subject you could possibly find. You're always present and you're really cheap. And it's an opportunity for an artist to experiment and to explore freely without worrying about needing to sell it to somebody um, or needing to find an audience uh, beyond themselves. Wolf Kahn. 1953, so we're getting a little bit closer to contemporary here. 
His, um, his self-portrait was actually a graduation portrait. Uh, he created it shortly after completing his education studying with the great painter Hans Hoffmann. Uh, and in this painting, he is demonstrating the style that he was working with at this moment. It's not the style that he's really best known for as a painter. He's far better known for a lot of his landscape paintings as opposed to his figuratives. Uh, but at this moment in 1953, as a young artist, he was working in this very expressive gestural style, sort of reflective of the spirit of action painting in the post-war era. You have a sense of him standing at his easel in his blue smock and as quickly as he is moving and painting, he's capturing a sense of that energy and his motion as he stands in front of that easel. Again, demonstrating his allegiance at that moment to a particular style. Our last example for sort of modern portraiture, again, ties into this idea of the modern artist um, using portraiture as a means to sort of reflect on what they're doing. Where Wolf Kahn was starting off as an artist, Stanton MacDonald Wright's portrait is actually a restart of his career. In the early 20th century, he would become one of the leading artists associated with chromatic art, focusing on the use of color as a means to sort of associate with musical tones. He would take a hiatus, going to Japan for, I believe it was like nearly 30 years he was overseas, and he basically abandoned painting at that time period in the chromatic style that he had essentially pioneered and become famous for. Shortly after returning, he creates this self-portrait of himself. So here we see him, the mature artist, placed in the immediate foreground, his gaze directly out at the viewer, and what is behind him is the chromatic style that he had pioneered and sort of this reflecting on what he was associated with and where he made his career as a painter. So what changes? In the 1960s and the 1970s, as the art market begins to broaden, and you have then the feminist movement, and you have the civil rights movement, the black art movement coming in, you have growing diversity coming into the art market, into the art world, you have a growing interest with wanting to examine this issue of authorship. Who has the authority to create a picture of you? And what right do they have to create that image and how do they control your work? So artists began to challenge that. Women began to say, hold on, I'm no longer going to be an object for a white male artist. I'm now going to seize that opportunity for myself and use that for myself and explore this issue of identity, explore this issue between the subject and the object, and explore this issue between representation between how my image is being um, represented through various media, whether it's photography, painting, popular culture, video, film. Joan Jonas, a pioneer of video arts and the feminist movements, her work, which of course the exhibition upstairs is titled for, Left Side, Right Side from 1972, is a seven minute video performance shot in black and white and she is exploring this idea of the mediated image and this idea of the body and the self. If you haven't seen it, I'll briefly try to explain it and hopefully it won't be too confusing, but you can imagine she's in a space. There's a mirror in front of her on one side and there is a video monitor in front of her on the other side, directly out in front of her. Mounted above her is a camera that is recording her. She's facing these. She can see her reflection, and she can see herself in the video monitor. Behind her is another camera 
that camera is mounted at a slight angle so that it is recording her as well as the reflection in the mirror and the video that is playing on the video monitor. And she explores this idea of, well, you have her, her physical body, but then you have her reflection. You have her being mediated through video. You have the representation of these through the, the video recording the reflection. Which is the authentic one? Which is the true one? And this idea of you can see something from multiple perspectives and see it differently from each spot. This opens this sort of conversation to thinking about portraiture in the contemporary time period. Artists begin to focus on, well, how can we challenge, how can we deconstruct, how can we interrogate what self-portraiture is? How can we reclaim this? How can we defy it or resist it? Jenny Morgan is um, an artist who draws inspiration from uh, feminist artists. Uh, you might be familiar with Joan Semmel. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, Jenny Savile um, as a, another artist who uses her body. Jenny Morgan is a Brooklyn-based artist. Originally, I believe she's out of Utah. Her work was included in the Get Real exhibition that we had at the Museum of Contemporary Art, oh gosh, I want to say seven or eight years ago. Um, and this work then was acquired from that exhibition. Her works are focused on representations of herself. She uses her own body, and she's been doing so since graduate school. Um, she largely does this because of the issue of convenience. It's easily accessible. But she also notes that this was something that she was doing. She uses her paintings as a way of working through some of her personal issues as she's going through them. In looking at this image, if you see this portrait, when you go upstairs, one of the things that you'll notice is the scale of it. It's not life size. She does her portraits so that they're larger than life. There's a monumental sort of feel to it when you compare it to images of her. And I think I brought in to give you an idea of scale and some of the diversity of her work. She works with photographs. So she takes photographs of her subjects, including herself. She sets up a camera, she puts it on a timer, and it creates then a series of photographs. The flash going off is what results in this almost sort of deer in the headlights gaze that you see on the expression of her face. And there's a sense of startledness, which she, she appreciates. She doesn't want that sense of that she is focusing on the camera as it's taking a picture of her. It's not that photographer model kind of relationship. So it creates this sense of distance. Now, while many of her portraits she does do, she has done full scale nudes, in this example, brand new, we see it's just from the shoulders up. There's no context in terms of she doesn't put that figure into a space. So she resists that element of finding information about a personal space where she may exist. She, she doesn't provide that for the viewer. The figure's not wearing clothes. We see her bare shoulder. So implicit here, she's exposed, yet she resists this idea of her body being objectified that her body being used as a sexual or viewed as a sexual object. She resists that in the image, although she's fully aware of this issue of exposing herself and how other people are seeing her. And this feeling of tension between not being able to fully control that and having that authority over how somebody understands your image. The striking gradient that you see here, the background is green, her face sort of goes through tones of orange into yellow, uh, is part of the process that she explores in this portrait. No brushwork is visible. The ground is red. She starts with a red ground. 
And do you see the little red dot that's at the top of her head? That red dot marks that that's the red ground that she begins painting with. And then she builds up the surface of paint onto that red ground. When she reaches a point of completion, she then begins to sand away the paint. A process of basically erasing. She's doing this in effect because she's not painting herself as an object. What she's trying to do here is represent herself in a spiritual sense or the soul removing that idea of the physicality of the body and capturing a sense of an aura, of a spirit, of a light. Marsha Hatcher. Marsha Hatcher is a local painter. You may have seen her work at um, any of the number of galleries or museum exhibitions uh, where her works have been included. Uh, this is her self-portrait de artist um, from 2020. This would be our sort of most contemporary um, of the uh, portraits that has been created. She looks amazing large scale up here, but when you see it in the gallery, it's actually a much more diminutive scale portrait. It's much more close to life size, but it has a power and authority as you see her here. Hatcher, in contrast to what Jenny Morgan is doing, who's sort of resisting this idea of um, uh, her portrait being uh, the exposure of her body and being something that can be uh, objectified uh, by a viewer, Marsha Hatcher confronts the viewer in this portrait. Notice in both images the figures were frontal, sort of recalling that Albert Durer image that we saw um, facing the viewer, not demurely turned to the side with cast eyes cast to the side, but frontal. And that idea of being very frontal is very sort of confrontational. It's seeing your viewer almost as an equal. She hasn't painted in a style that is hyper-realistic and smooth. Instead, it's painterly. There's gesture there. There's mark and trace of the artist that is present. She is celebrating her achievements in a way that a black woman has historically been left out of art history. She is claiming that authorship and that authority to represent herself. There's a photograph that I have of her working on this portrait. So you can see a little bit of the side. And I love this photograph of her because it kind of plays interestingly off of what we were talking about, the left side, right side. You have the, the photograph of her from behind. We see her reflection in the mirror that she is working from. So direct observation, as opposed to what Jenny Morgan was doing, was working with photographs um, and sort of altering those photographs. And then, of course, the other side of that, we see the painting in progress uh, as she is working on it. In the final version of it, you see the ground in this radiant red. There's a vibrancy and there's an energy that she is projecting uh, in this self-portrait to the audience. There's a joy and there's a power in that commanding view. She is scrutinizing you. you know, look at the, the sort of furrow between her eyes as she's looking directly out at you. And if you look carefully at it, among this sort of 
um, there's a, almost like a halo, an aura of light that surrounds her, and the energy of her locks uh, that move around her, giving her this sense of um, uh, sort of motion and energy. But if you look carefully at her, her chin is tilted just slightly, and her eyelids down, holding her head up at such an angle gives, as you approach this painting and you look at it, it may be at your level, but at the same time, she's angled it to give herself this slight position of authority as she looks at you. So you're sort of challenging that notion of who has authority. She takes it for herself and presents that for the viewer. The last work for me is, is one of the more interesting because it sort of sparks a conversation about some bigger issues in the direction of contemporary art, in particular with portraiture. I have here, of course, this is Doug Ang's mixed media piece titled Replicated Self Number Two. It's a combination of corrugated cardboard and foam core. And it was very much, if you're, if you're familiar with Doug Eng's work, he's of course a professional photographer based here in Jacksonville, um, fine art photographer, but he has an interest in engineering and science and technology, exploring how things work. The work is comprised then and inspired by the selfie that you see of Doug in the back. His eye peeks just out through the center. He's taken a selfie and he identifies it in his description of this work as a selfie. He doesn't describe it as a photograph. And I made that distinction because that will be a very important concept to think about moving forward in terms of what is contemporary portraiture. You have the image of the selfie. Now he has printed this selfie out which is not a very common thing to do. I don't think most of us print out our selfies. Instead, we share them on social media platforms or we just keep them on our phone and hope nobody ever sees them. But he has printed this out uh, and then he has taken that image and he has put it into uh, a computer which has created then a 3D sort of topographical map of his face. And he has then printed that out um, onto the corrugated cardboard and has uh, cut it out. He has painstakingly then pasted these pieces of cardboard together to create this sort of topographical uh, surface of the face. It's cut into sections and you can notice that each section is slightly different. Again, sort of playing off of that idea of the multiple different perspectives that are all the result of the single image that we begin with. And it's that selfie and it's the issue of identity that I think is most pressing in thinking about contemporary art uh, and uh, contemporary uh, portraiture and self-portraiture. The selfie. How many of you, I'm sure you all have selfies somewhere. Everybody takes selfies, the ubiquitous selfies. Uh, I think it was in 2013, New Oxford Dictionary listed selfie as the word of the year. It feels like it's been around forever, but it hasn't actually been around forever. It hasn't been around that long. Uh, it is still very much new technology and new media, but it's extremely controversial. And it's causing some sort of interesting questions in terms of what do we do with the selfie? Now the selfie isn't just simply a photograph of oneself. I mean, those of us of a certain age remember, of course, doing something like a Polaroid and you could take a Polaroid picture of yourself and you'd have a photograph of yourself. And of course, with old fashioned cameras, you could stand in a mirror and take a picture of yourself and the flash would go off into the side. We're not talking about simply taking a photograph of yourself. A selfie, of course, is taking a photograph of yourself with this mobile device, your camera phone. 
And then what do you do with your selfie? We don't print them off. We don't frame them and put them on the wall. We put them into social media. We put them on platforms, Tumblr, Instagram, Facebook. We share them through these alternate spaces. The selfie is often ridiculed. And people talk about selfies. They talk about that this is uh, an example of narcissism of an entire generation. They denigrate the selfie as being sort of the lowest common denominator of visual production. That selfies, oh, everybody takes selfies. The selfies is narcissism. Selfies are the, the, the example of an, a person with a, a psychological disorder. And they frequently then associate this with it's something that's being a preoccupation of certain women and their need to produce selfies. And then the application of filters onto those selfies. When anybody starts to attack something that way, it always makes me pause and think, why? Why does the selfie bother you so much? Why are you threatened by it? The selfie holds the potential to really sort of undermine art, to undermine the concept of portraiture. Let me ask you all, are selfies self-portraits? I think we would have to say yes. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an interesting debate. It seems like such a sort of straightforward question. On one hand, so specific, are selfies self-portraiture? Oh well, yeah, it's a bit amorphous because we're not really sure here. And what that actually requires you to do is, okay, well, wait a minute. In order to determine if it is self-portraiture, maybe what it's calling into question is, what is self-portraiture? I have definitions. I pulled these this afternoon after class. Screen captures right off the internet. The top one, New Oxford Dictionary. Self-portrait, a portrait of an artist produced or created by that artist. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, defining self-portrait. A portrait of oneself, done by oneself. What's the difference? The word yeah. The question then becomes, well then, who has the authority to produce the self-portrait? An artist or oneself? That's where we run into a problem, because that opens up a can of worms. That's the argument that nobody ever likes to have. That's the argument that causes my students to audibly grown because it's what it's questioning well how do we define that art if anybody can take a selfie and call it self portraiture then you're calling into question then the authority the intent who is taking these images if you think about self selfies as fine art as self portraiture and you're prepared to accept that, well then that of course opens up a much broader dialogue in terms of, well then where are we exhibiting these? How are we exhibiting them? What's the authority over this? It opens much broader conversations in terms of sort of determining what is art, what is a self-portrait, and where does portraiture go from there? If we open it wide up, then the broader issue is, well, if that's art, then everything is art. So there's broader implications there. But the selfie is still such a new medium. I think in 10 years, 20 years, if that, um, you see exhibitions. I believe Saatchi had an exhibition recently where they created an entire gallery, and it was all selfie images. They, critics claim that, oh, well, this was just a gimmick. Well, is it? 
or is it the start of a new sort of focus on what portraits are? And one of the things that, of course, the selfie and the self-portrait raises is who writes meaning onto that image? You create that selfie, but once you put it out there, who's creating the, 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 the information associated with it? Who's writing on your image and who's creating your identity? Who are you giving that authorship to? Because a selfie, more so probably than a painted self-portrait, has that flexibility of going out into the world and being used and reinterpreted um, and rewritten on in more ways than a single painting um, in a gallery. So the future of self-portraiture becomes very, very interesting. Every time we see a shift in technology, when the shift of photography came about, it shifted away from needing to document the likeness. With the emergence of video, it made people aware of how their image is being mediated, how stereotypes are being formed and how they're being circulated, how perspectives are being shaped. But with the, intro the introduction then of the selfie, it complicates that issue even further. And it becomes sort of interesting to think about where are we going to be with 10 years uh, into the future. So um, I stop here. Uh, I thank you all for joining me this evening. If you haven't been up to see the left side, right side exhibition, I hope you will. Um, it's up for, it's up till next year, isn't it? Yes, um, uh, So please do stop in and check it out and take a look at the works that you saw here, but then uh, the other works that are included in that exhibition. There's a lot of sort of um, uh, rich topics to be examined and explored when thinking about these issues of, of portraits and identities and representation of self. So I, I thank you um, and uh, thank you. Yes, thank you.